Okay, so yet another uh, change in uh, uh, topic. Uh, so what I want to do is talk about materials. I'm not going to talk so much about the computational effort to understand the materials. Uh, Ye Zheng Zing, boy, uh, Ye Zheng is going to talk about that uh, this afternoon uh, and describe some of the algorithms and uh, crowdsourcing approaches. Uh, this work is in collaboration with uh, Carla and uh, Bart Selman. Um, Actually, I'll mention a little bit about some stuff that we did with uh, fuel cell catalysts, um, not really metastable materials, uh, just to try to put it in context and make, make it a little more clear what it is, we're, what the challenge is in, computationally. Um, but what I want to focus on is this idea of um, discovering metastable materials uh, that basically uh, give you a wider range of types of materials you can make. It's like as if you had a different uh, periodic table to work with. Okay, so the, the motivation for this uh, from the sustainability uh, sense is the idea that uh, new materials are needed uh, for, um, to solve problems related to energy. Uh, so there was this big uh, report that Carla uh, mentioned on uh, yesterday uh, and right up in the front page uh, inside the uh, uh, cover, uh, scientific breakthroughs in new materials needed to uh, uh, solve energy problems. Okay, so that's, yeah, I take that as, as given I'm a material scientist, so it's got to be true. Um, so how are you going to discover new, uh, new materials? The standard way you do is you get a bunch of people, you know, grad students or whatever, and they work really hard and they all, each one makes one material and they spend, uh, you know, six months making a material or something. What we're doing, um, our approach is to uh, go to high throughput uh, materials discovery, make lots of materials at the same time, uh, and uh, look at their properties and try to understand what's going on. So an example here, this is uh, a single experiment, one sample uh, with a composition gradient uh, of a couple of different, three different uh, elements. Uh, uh, effectively 4,223 samples on, in this one experiment, okay. Uh, this was actually titanium, zirconium, tin, oxide, uh, and so the region of composition space that we covered is, is this region. We're looking at some property in this particular case, uh, capacitance. We can look at all kinds of different properties. Just how do we actually make these things? Uh, John Gregoire talked a little bit about how they do that at uh, JCAP in, uh, at Caltech, um, but this is the same thing. It's, it's vacuum deposition. You can think of it as atomic spray painting uh, from three separate sources. So you have a blue source, a red source, a green source, Turn them all on at the same time. The atoms come down uh, intimately mixed. Uh, so it's blue rich over here, green rich, red rich, and everything else in between, okay? Um, you, again, you can think of it as atomic spray paint. We make these things with all sorts of different compositions all at once. And then we measure properties in some high throughput, uh, high throughput way. One possibility, this is uh, looking at catalytic activity. Um, this is actually John Gregoire's uh, data when he was uh, a postdoc at our, uh, in our group. Uh, for palladium, rhodium, tantalum, uh, this is actually, these are metals, and looking at some derived measure of uh, activity, a, a figure of merit, okay, objective function, if you will. And, and then we can, we can map that uh, or related data um, onto a um, ternary phase diagram, ternary composition diagram, and we see there's the red stuff that's good. Uh, the low numbers are good. Okay, so the question is, is that just a function of composition or is there something more you know, underlying that's important going on? Namely, in particular, uh, the structure of the material, what, what crystal structure is, is uh, associated with the good activity or is it a combination of the two? And that's, that's essentially the question we're trying to answer here in order to get a better understanding of the materials uh, so that we can move forward and, and think about other uh, materials related possibly. So the question is what crystal structures might we get? Uh, we're typically depositing at room temperature and then we might do an anneal or something. The idea is that the atoms eventually are going to uh, form a crystal structure. Uh, there's an example, that's rock salt. Uh, I was trying to think of other structures you might have heard of, but you know, garnet structure, pyrite structure, they're all different, um, different arrangements of the same, um, you know, same atoms, just in a different uh, uh, symmetry, different organization, okay? But for a given set of elements, uh, in, in a set particular proportion, they will form phases uh, determined by the proportions of the elements. So I have just to try to put, make that more explicit. If you go from uh, silicon dioxide to aluminum oxide, um, 
as a function of composition, so we're just increasing the aluminum concentration uh, from left to right. It turns out that for one particular composition, you actually get a new compound. So this is a compound SiO2, that's a compound aluminum oxide. In this region, you get a mixture of the mullite plus aluminum oxide. Here you have more mullite, a little bit of aluminum oxide. Here you have more aluminum oxide, a little bit of mullite, but there's both of them present at the same time. Over this particular region, uh, that's a single phase region, and you get just 100% mullite. Uh, and then over here on the silicon uh, dioxide side, uh, pure silicon dioxide, pure mullite, and, and mixtures in between. Okay, so the point is though, for any given composition, you can tell what the, what the material is gonna be. Okay, how do we figure out what the, what the structure actually is? We do X-ray diffraction. Basically, we're bringing X-rays with a uh, wavelength about the spacing between uh, atom planes, uh, and you look at the diffraction, okay? It's like taking the Fourier transform. We end up with a, um, uh, a pattern that, um, that relates to um, the, the set of planes in, in, the, in the structure. And that's gonna be unique depending on what the structure is, okay? Uh, so it's, a, it's, a, it's like a fingerprint. It's kind of like a fingerprint. It's actually a little more complicated than that because it's not just uh, two, you know, one, you could have two things at the same time, but it's not two full fingerprints at the same time. You could have one getting stronger, one getting weaker, depending on the amount of material. So this is trying to illustrate that. Uh, again, uh, so uh, in this case, a platinum rich, I drew it up and down this time, platinum rich on this side, continuous change in composition to ruthenium rich. So those, that's always the average composition. Uh, if you take the, uh, an X-ray pattern at exactly that spot, you get this pattern. I wanna take that, I wanna plot out all the X-ray patterns though. So the way to do that is turn this into a heat map. So that, that uh, pattern corresponds to this heat map. So in fact, um, you take these four, four peaks, one, two, three, four, that's on this guy here, that's one, two, three, four. And then there's other peaks out here, okay? Point is, in one dimension, so this is a one dimensional spread, uh, it's much simpler than the 2D spreads, you can actually see what's going on. You can see that down here, there are, there's um, the ruthenium rich phase, it's ruthenium down here, uh, platinum up there, platinum rich anyway. So there's a, a bunch of patterns here that are, it's just pure ruthenium phase. It's got platinum in it, so the platinum's going in on ruthenium sites, but it's got the same symmetry as the ruthenium phase. And then up, uh, up, up above, it's pure platinum. And then in this region in the middle, uh, so let's see, actually I have it, platinum. so there's a pure platinum with ruthenium substituted. There's ruthenium with platinum substituted. And then in the middle, you've got both fingerprints at the same time, but the platinum fingerprint is fading away. Here, the ruthenium fingerprint is fading away, okay? That's what we're trying to figure out. This is pretty easy to do in, in, uh, in 1D. You just look at it and you say, yeah, I got it. Okay, trying to do that in, uh, in, a, in a 2D composition spread um, is actually very difficult. And you're trying to look at all these patterns and um, basically it causes brain freeze. Uh, and so uh, that's where the computational uh, stuff comes in, the uh, computer science. But now I wanna move on to talking about these metastable materials. Okay, so the thing is, um, you can actually calculate, um, I think that's, this is a reasonable way to think about it. You can, you can um, take all the atoms, put them in a crystal structure, calculate what the energy of that crystal is, okay? Use quantum mechanics, this is a, uh, you know, guy's got Nobel Prize for figuring this stuff out, but it's, it's now really a standard thing to do. So you just do that. Uh, so as a function of composition, here's another, uh, this is one dimensional, for going from silicon to lithium, uh, you can calculate out for different crystal structures, what's the energy of the system. The lowest energy one is the one that's gonna be the stable phase. Okay, so that's there, it's this convex hull, okay? But you can also imagine, what about a different crystal structure? How, what's that energy? Uh, that's what you calculate out, and so these, these green, uh, purple things are different structures calculated out. They have higher energies, so they're not the stable phase. They're not the thing that should, uh, that should form, okay? Sometimes they're way higher energy, and they're really not likely to form at all. Sometimes they're only slightly higher energy, and, and in fact, they might, uh, they might be accessible, okay? One minute. One minute, okay. Minus one minute. I'm already at minus one. Oh, sorry. Okay, so... Uh, is this interesting to do, to, to look for metastable materials? Point of this is yes, you could find some really neat stuff. We're not gonna talk about why. How are we gonna find it? How are we gonna make metastable materials? Um, basically, we're, the idea here is to do this systematically uh, and deliberately. 
Uh, we do it by, um, uh, by la laser spike annealing. This is where uh, Professor Thompson comes in. Um, so we take it up to some high temperature as a function of time, uh, and we can change the uh, maximum temperature, and we can change the, the time scale there, okay? Uh, so by changing the dwell time, uh, we change the quench rate, and so we can get different materials. So this is an example, uh, and I guess I don't have much time to talk about it, but the, the key point here uh, is that uh, this, um, you always get the, in, in equilibrium, you get the lowest energy phase. So this is plotting out the energy of various crystal structures for bismuth oxide as a function of temperature. And at, at low temperature, you get the alpha phase. At some higher temperature, it switches over to the delta phase. And then finally, it melts. The, uh, what we can do by systematically changing the peak temperature and the dwell time uh, is get uh, phases that aren't supposed to form. So if you go to dwell times of really long, that's getting close to equilibrium. That's what people always see. Uh, what they never see is this uh, delta phase at room temperature. So these, what this is mapping out is what phase do you see once you've cooled it back down if you go to a certain temperature for a certain dwell time. And the point is we can get that delta phase, let's go back here, uh, this phase, all the way down at room temperature. Uh, we basically set, you know, got it stuck in the, in the system. Um, that's the point. Uh, that's what we're doing. And effectively what that does is makes elements behave not the way they normally do. We're not getting equilibrium materials. We're getting metastable materials that can have really, really interesting properties. Uh, it sort of expands the periodic table, and that's the sense in which, which it goes. So that's the exciting part about it for, from my perspective. Okay.